Of course, Dr. Stapp had a heck of a time to get me permission to do this because very few people had any faith in the equipment that we were testing. And, and it was so fixed that if I got killed, that Stapp was going to pay for it for the rest of his life. The crew was just crazy about him. We come out first, we have lots of work to do, and it take too long to get him ready, maybe a couple hours or so. So he comes out later, and the crew is uptight. You know, boy, we want to get everything perfect. You know, this is for Joe. So he goes around <laughs> trying to calm us down. <laughs> you know, Paddock's on the back saying, hey, this is a no sweat operation. <laughs> so here he was, one of the most dangerous enterprises in history, and he was trying to calm us down. The flurry of activity before an Excelsior flight was a quiet time for Joe, as he rid his body of nitrogen to avoid the bends during his ascent. Captain Kittinger would ascend in an open gondola through temperatures at least 100 degrees below zero. Both he and his equipment would need to stay warm. The solution was classic bootleg engineering, a bundle of plastic water bottles under Kittinger's rear, which would naturally give off heat as part of their freezing process during the long, slow climb. In order that the test be as realistic as possible, Kittinger chose not to wear a full spacesuit going instead with the fighter pilot's standard issue, partial pressure suit. Well, I went with the partial pressure suit mainly because that's what our air crew members were using, and I wanted to demonstrate to our air crew members that we were giving them damn good equipment. I'd bet my life on it. This jump would be a relatively low altitude test of the system, and just as on Man High 1, an unforeseen problem occurred. Data recorders and batteries were stored in an 80-pound kit strapped to Joe's lower back, which he would slice free as he fell. As the gondola approached the target altitude of 76,000 feet, the water bottles beneath him froze, clamping that kit into the styrofoam seat like a vice. It took Joe a critical 16 seconds to free himself before he could step off the platform. At first, Joe didn't think he was falling. With no air rushing past him, he had the alarming sensation of hanging in space, possibly forever. It was only when he rolled on his back and saw the balloon that he realized he was traveling at hundreds of miles per hour. But the extra time on the gondola with the chute timer activated now resulted in a life-threatening emergency as the drogue chute deployed and wrapped around Joe's neck, sending him right into the deadly flat spin they'd been trying to avoid. I wanted to look at my altimeter, which was on my left wrist. I had a great interest in my altimeter because if I was low enough, I would have pulled my chute because I'd really start to spin up quite rapidly. But the centrifugal force was so great, I couldn't pull my arms in. And then I passed out because of the, of the G-forces. And my emergency parachute opened uh, on schedule at about 10,000 feet and it saved my life because I was unconscious when the, when the chute opened. 